from Washington, D.C., this is Middle East Focus. Hello, and welcome to Middle East Focus, a weekly podcast on regional affairs and U.S. policy produced by the Middle East Institute in Washington, D.C. I'm Alistair Taylor and the Eyes Editorial Director. On today's program, we'll be discussing the Israeli government's suppression of Palestinian online speech and activism, and the surprising role that American social media companies play in the process. Joining us to discuss this important topic are Eliza Campbell and Emerson T. Brooking. Eliza is the director of MEI's cyber program and the co-editor of the book, Cyber War and Cyber Peace in the Middle East. Emerson is a resident senior fellow at the Atlantic Council's Digital Forensic Research Lab and the co-author of the book, Like War, The Weaponization of Social Media. Eliza and Emerson are also the co-authors of a recently published article in Foreign Policy that serves as the starting point for today's discussion, entitled How to End Israel's Digital Occupation. It's a great piece, and I'd encourage all of our listeners to read it. Eliza Emerson, welcome to the program, and thank you both for joining us today. Thanks so much. Great to be here. Thank you. Eliza, while the day-to-day life for the nearly 5 million residents of the Palestinian territories is marked by the reality of occupation, Palestinians have long been much freer online, able to communicate and share their stories with the world using tools like social media. Why has this digital space been so important for them? Yeah, it's a great question. And thank you so much for bringing that up. So I think this is a really important starting point for this entire conversation, this kind of background and context. It's hard for you know us in the United States or in Europe to really conceive of this, having grown up in a world where the right and the access to you know digital tools and to social media just had a completely different flavor, a completely different reality than it did for a lot of places outside of the United States. But for a lot of people living in the Middle East and in Palestine in particular, you know, access to broadband internet, access to high-speed internet, and eventually to mobile connections just came at a completely different pace. And that meant that, for example, although less than 2% of Palestinians had internet access in 2001, as we write in the piece, that figure rose really exponentially to like 41% about 10 years later. So that meant that it just sort of had this much more intensified rollout and played a completely different role in the lives of Palestinians than it did in maybe in the lives of Europeans. So, for example, the Palestinian Museum Signature Project, the Digital Archive, was originally placed online and has existed online this entire time for the purpose of really providing one of the only places in the world where, you know, Palestinian maps, documents, photos can be archived safely because the physical realities of life in the occupied territories mean that online spaces just are sometimes the only place to go for true safety or for true kind of communication. So I think that's a really critical kind of thing to frame in the background when we talk about this digital occupation. Emerson, this this online freedom that Palestinians have enjoyed that, that Eliza just touched on is now increasingly under threat on several fronts, including first and foremost by Israel's police and surveillance apparatus within the occupied territories. How does Israel use that to target Palestinian online speech and, and on kind of what legal basis? Yeah, so the legal framework that targets Palestinian expression has evolved considerably over the last few years. I think when you're talking about this issue, you have to start with the stabbing intifada in 2015, in which this was sort of considered a, a wave of lone wolf terrorism, which swept Palestine, in which young Palestinians inspired by Hamas propaganda or viral videos of privations of the Israeli military police, they attempted some 300 stabbings, shootings, and rammings, and killed 34 civilians in Israel. Israel responded by killing uh, about 150 suspected Palestinian attackers, but they also significantly increased online surveillance. And they built, for instance, their first networks of fake Facebook accounts to actively look for any sort of Palestinian expression that might be suspicious, that might be potentially indicative of a a terror attack. And at the same time, they also passed a new counterterrorism law in 2016. And and I should say, even as the stabbing intifada faded away, the surveillance efforts did not. This was basically hearkening in a new normal. And with this 2016 counterterrorism law, which focused a lot on online expression, Israel broadly criminalized quote, identification with terrorism or incitement to terrorism. It also introduced powerful new enforcement mechanisms against anything that the Israeli government defined as a terrorist organization. 
but who or what could be defined as a terrorist organization was very much left up to grabs. And also critically, the enforcement of this law was not just in the state of Israel, but it was also in areas A and B of the West Bank, which have long been under Palestinian sovereignty. And the, the net result of all of this was that someone could share a, a Facebook update or just write something online and could possibly expect Israeli military police to detain them at any moment under a charge of incitement or a, a association with terrorism. Emerson, just following up on that, roughly 2,000 Palestinians have been arrested by Israeli security officials for, for social media posts over the last four years along the lines that you've, you've just described. Israel says it uses, quote, AI-assisted predictive policing. And I wanted to kind of drill down into that a little bit more because it sounds like something that's, that's sort of straight out of science fiction. What do we know about what that actually entails? It's straight out of science fiction, but it's also totally a black box. It's, as best we can tell, what's happening under the hood is a kind of psychographic profile along the lines of the stuff that one associates with Cambridge Analytica. And social media posts of particular, quote, suspects are part of that equation. What's interesting, though, is that this, this digital activity gets mapped back onto the real world. In November, the Washington Post broke news of this new surveillance system codenamed Blue Wolf, which is a, a smartphone app which is trying to create a photographic record of Palestinians across the West Bank, trying to take tens of thousands of uh, photographs of residents. And then the end goal is basically when a Palestinian is crossing an Israeli military checkpoint, that the app scans their face, and then the um, the Israeli military police officer basically looks at the app and it flashes a different color based on whether or not that person should be detained or released. Now, Israeli officials say that this sort of profiling has prevented hundreds of terror attacks, but of course, there's absolutely no transparency and no way to prove any of that. And in reality, this, this sort of intermeshing system of profiling looks a lot like a case in 2017, where a Palestinian construction worker, early in the morning, does a post on Facebook posing next to a forklift, and he writes, good morning. Because of the, the limits of machine translation, like Facebook auto-translated this as, quote, attack them. And this post gets funneled up the chain in an Israeli police station, Israeli analysts freak out because no one can actually speak Arabic, and they arrest and detain the guy. And only after extensive interrogation do they realize that uh, this was all a consequence of a translation error. And I should note, too, that as Palestinians are you know, flagged by these invisible systems and they're arrested under charges of incitement, they aren't permitted to lawyers during their interrogation by military police. They've been compelled in some cases to sign Hebrew language confessions, a language that many Palestinians do not speak. And if one looks at sort of the, the structural incentives at play here, the charge of the Israeli police and the Israeli military and the broader security state is to prevent as many attacks as possible. And that sort of incentivizes them to arrest as many Palestinians as possible, simply because the rights of Palestinians do not play a significant factor in these security decisions. Eliza, as concerning as, as all of this is, and it, it is deeply, this effort isn't just limited to Israel and the occupied territories or even the Middle East. The Israeli government has, has targeted pro-Palestinian expression elsewhere as well. How has it gone about this and, and what effects could that have more broadly? Yeah, definitely. Well, I mean, the big social media companies, probably Facebook, Twitter being the most powerful here, when they release decisions about content takedowns, for example, or about definitions of content moderation that they make that do have these really kind of global impacts on the right to pro-Palestinian expression, I think there's a little bit of a fig leaf of neutrality, the idea that you know a company is capable of making a decision that's purely technical or purely apolitical. But at some point, you know, these companies do make political categorizations, they do make political decisions. And this is probably one of the arenas where that is most clear. 
So there's this really interesting example of how Facebook, for example, has chosen to categorize the concept of anti-Semitism, which is an extremely dangerous and extremely, you know, worrying and growing problem on social media. I mean, this outburst, I guess, of growing anti-Semitism and growing anti-Semitic content, especially in social media. But in response to that, social media companies have made the distinct decision to start making official policies that conflate anti-Zionism with anti-Semitism, which means that a legitimate, you know, critique of the Israeli government or of the, the occupation of Palestinian territories gets kind of sucked up into that larger category of, of actual anti-Semitism. And we have Facebook, for example, on record agreeing to go along with or to, you know, take their cues from specific definitions of anti-Semitism that make this categorization. And so this isn't something that's kind of in the ether, we have, you know, legitimate kind of expressions of the decisions being made. And I think it's, it's important to consider as well that Israel is a tech hub, one of the only regional offices for Google and the only regional offices for Facebook is located in Israel. And the government has, you know, in its own interests, made a lot of efforts at kind of outreach, lobbying has been very careful in kind of structuring its responses to this problem and to this idea through, you know, direct targeted outreach to social media companies in these content moderation questions. And as of now, a lot of the questions related to content, as Emerson referenced, go to this cyber unit, which is under the Ministry of Justice or which is under the auspices of the Ministry of Justice, which usually conducts this internal review process for reviewing the legality of the particular content. And we know that about 99% of requests made just in 2018, for example, were accepted or undertaken by social media companies. Most of them were references to terrorism or incitement to violence. But even outside of Israel in particular, when social media companies go about defining what terrorism is, for example, this is another thing like anti-Semitism that, you know, in theory sounds like it should be pretty apolitical, it should be pretty neutral to make these definitions. But in reality, a lot of content that might be connected to kind of just legitimate political discussions or, you know, freedom of speech or discussions of Palestinian rights, often, particularly if it's in a language like Arabic, or especially a colloquial dialect of Arabic that, you know, these algorithms are not equipped to translate, might get kind of sucked up into this larger label of terrorist content. So what that means is even from, you know, the perspective of Palestinians living in the diaspora outside of Palestine or outside of Israel, for anyone from any nationality that's interested in expressing solidarity with Palestinian rights, with the BDS movement, whatever it may be, it does happen to be the case that just by nature of these decisions and by nature of the way that these policies have been built over time, it becomes much harder to express pro-Palestinian speech and to have pro-Palestinian content online. And that's as a direct result of these efforts by the Israeli government and, and by other significant actors. Yeah, and it's it's important to take a step back and just see how these softer measures of the control of speech can come together with the definition of anti-Semitism that is advanced by the Israeli government and that Israeli lobbyists want social media companies to adopt. Not only does it conflate Jewish identity completely with Zionism, but then it also categorizes many common criticisms of Israeli government policy as anti-Semitism. And if those definitions are adopted by social media companies, then it, it necessarily means that one can talk less freely about Palestinian history or Palestinian self-determination. Because the, the modern history of Palestine is sort of bound up inextricably in a hostile relationship between Israelis and Palestinians, between, for instance, the forced expulsion of hundreds of thousands of Palestinians from their homes in the late 1940s. So there's a real concern that even abstract speech issues, you know, debates over particular definitions could end up erasing important bits of Palestinian history. Emerson, one of the most concerning aspects here, uh, especially I think for our, our listeners in the U.S., is the involvement of Silicon Valley and American tech companies. What role have they played in all of this? And, and can you maybe kind of elaborate a little bit more on the, the impact that's had? Sure. Look, it, at the root of it, Silicon Valley has quite a lot to fear from the Israeli government. The Israeli government can 
issue subpoenas. They have credibly threatened very serious regulation in their, quote, Facebook bill, which would be, if it's ever passed, one of the the strictest content moderation measures ever passed by a, a democracy targeting social media companies. Israeli security officials have requested and gotten regular consultations with tech company leadership since at least 2016. And as Eliza mentioned, Tel Aviv is the biggest tech hub in the Middle East. There are all of these formal and informal connections between the Israeli government and tech companies, which enable them to exert quite a bit of influence. And by contrast, there's very little that Palestinian activists can actually do to sort of move the needle with these companies. They can't issue subpoenas or police orders. They can't threaten new laws or regulation. And really, no matter how persuasively Palestinians argue for the right to free speech, the deck is stacked against them. And a great example can be seen in the May protests over Israeli land seizures in East Jerusalem. Over the course of what began as a protest and then turned into armed conflict, and a, a Palestinian digital rights organization, Hamla, noted some 700 instances of pro-Palestinian content that was downranked or removed over the, the course of a few weeks, often without adequate explanation. And, you know, this created an extraordinarily dangerous situation for activists on the ground who were often, you know, using hashtags or these online tools to coordinate and share crucial information and also to remain visible because it was their sort of their visibility to the wider world, which was their only protection in these civic actions against Israeli riot police. So a great example of this disproportionate content moderation in action can be seen during the the protests in East Jerusalem in the neighborhood of Sheikh Jarrah. Activists sometimes took sanctuary in Al-Aqsa Mosque, which is the, the third holiest site of Islam. Now, when these activists were, were capturing Israeli riot police's assaults on the mosque, they often used the hashtag Alexa. The problem is that Instagram categorized this, this Alexa hashtag is supportive of terrorism and rendered it unavailable during a crucial night at the very peak of this stage of the civic protests. And it was just just another example of the the broad brush that these companies paint with when it comes to Arabic language expression and the incredible conservatism they show, which invariably suppresses Palestinian speech to the benefit of the Israeli government. And all of these factors only got worse later in the May conflict when Hamas got involved, because Hamas began indiscriminate bombardment of Israel. The IDF responded with extensive airstrikes that ultimately killed nearly 200 Palestinians and left over 10,000 homeless. But the Human Rights Watch, for instance, recorded cases where Palestinians on the ground in Gaza, now under bombardment from the Israeli military, would simply take a a photo of the, the damage being wrought by Israeli bombs. The caption was, quote, this is a photo of my family's building before it was struck by Israeli missiles. And these sorts of posts were removed out of a vague allegation of incitement to violence. And I should note, too, that at the same time this was happening, this incredibly sort of broad and suppressive measures overseen by these companies targeting Palestinian digital expression, no such action was taken against Hebrew language hate speech. Also in in early May, as the conflict was heating up, Israeli lynch mobs were coordinating on WhatsApp and attacking Palestinians in East Jerusalem. And there, there simply was not the same kind of attention. And the systems that are so aggressive in silencing Palestinians were not deployed against Hebrew ultranationalists. Eliza, we've spent a lot of time in this program so far covering the the problems, but I wanted to turn now to potential fixes to some of the issues that we've discussed, starting with the actions of Facebook's own oversight board, which has called for an independent investigation into this issue of content moderation and a review of the company's policies. 
Do you think that could lead potentially to, to real change or even set a precedent for changes among other tech companies? Sure. Yeah. The Facebook Supreme Court, as it is sometimes called, which I'm sure will be accompanied sooner rather than later by a Facebook Congress or I don't even know. Yeah. So this is a really interesting question. And I think this is Facebook as a company or meta, I guess now with a lot of its really powerful products responding to and trying to kind of get ahead of this PR disaster that this has been in some circles for them. So the incident in question that prompted this decision by the Facebook Oversight Board was actually during the May incidents in Gaza and in the occupied territories when a Facebook user in Egypt actually shared a news item from the news platform Al Jazeera, which did contain a threat of violence by the Qasem brigades by a spokesperson. And Facebook initially removed this content after it was reviewed by two content moderators for violating its community standard on dangerous people and organizations, which is sort of the, the large kind of definition Emerson referred to under which the Al-Aqsa Mosque was supposedly <laughs> sucked up into this definition as well. And although Facebook did restore the decision and did release this decision saying that they plan to carry out a careful review of these kinds of patterns, I think this is really emblematic of Facebook's systematic over-enforcement, as it's been called by different organizations, of community standards when it comes to questions of speech by Arab and Muslim communities, and especially speech in the Arabic language. So a lot of social media companies, Facebook in particular, developed a lot of their content moderation policies in and around the immediate aftermath of 9-11, of the rise of ISIS in the Middle East, when there was a lot of kind of this idea, legitimately so, of being really attentive to the issue of Islamic terrorist content online. But that means that when it comes to an understanding of political speech by Arabic speakers or by, you know, political speech by people living in the Middle East, there's a lot less nuance when it comes to uh, allowing that kind of legitimate speech, the legitimate expression to be online and to stay online. So the decision and after in the wake of this decision, Facebook did call for a careful review of whether Facebook's content moderation policies in Arabic or Hebrew, including its use of automation, have been applied without bias. I think it's a good first step, but I don't think it goes far enough by any means. Basically, I mean, the only way to really consider what the impact of these kinds of over-policing of speech is would be to try and consider the implications kind of in live in real time and to really think about what kind of damage was done and how to actually make up for that damage. So even though the Facebook Oversight Board, you know, is supposedly this quasi-independent body, none of its representatives were elected, none of its representatives represent, you know, the elected interests of Palestinians or of any particular nation or people. And the organization is ultimately beholden to the interests of the company. And there's no mechanism for enforcement and there's no mechanism for accountability when it comes to these decisions. Basically, it's just kind of commenting on them, you know, after the fact. And the reality is, you know, sort of as Emerson said, the only way to really undo the damage of removing content when especially when it's speech by politically repressed peoples would be to go back in time and to put it online at the time when it really needed to be online. And there's no way to do that. And I don't see the Facebook Oversight Board at this time really considering any kinds of enforcement mechanisms or accountability mechanisms for the potential damages of the decisions taken by its parent company. So until that is taken into consideration, to be honest, I don't really see this having any lasting effects. But Emerson, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this too. Yeah, look, I was impressed by the thoughtfulness of the Facebook Oversight Board's decision. It's clear that there are is some systemic anti-Palestinian bias in content moderation decisions. It's great that we're going to get a report that examines it more fully, but I fear that this maybe is a small step in the right direction, but as Eliza said, it's, it's not remunerative justice. It's not going to help the things that were already done. And in any sort of independent study of these sorts of issues, that itself is going to become a fiercely contested battlefield. And I, I think whatever conclusions are endorsed by the parent company, that they will be extremely watered down the middle of the road by the time they see the public eye. I'd just love to add one more thing as well at this. So something else to consider is that it's no secret, and I think our listeners will probably be familiar with the fact that this kind of practice of conflating 
political speech and particularly political opposition with terrorism as a category is something that's been in the authoritarian playbook for quite some time now. And so this is basically an extension of the types of repression of free speech that have existed around the world basically for the past 20 years, especially since 9-11, when it became much easier to categorize political speech that you didn't agree with or that you found threatening with terrorism. And that's something that the governments of the Middle East in particular have been really adept at, have passed a lot of you know, local laws, local internet laws for content moderation that have, you know, designated the speech of political opposition parties or of their, you know, human rights groups, civil society organizations with terrorist content and have taken down organizations' websites or content on the basis of these justifications. So I think this is basically something that a lot of the most repressive governments around the world when it comes to internet regimes are taking a really close watch and are ramping up their ability to basically conflate almost any kind of free speech, particularly in politically contested environments, with terrorism. And so Facebook should consider that really, really closely when it comes to making these kinds of decisions as well. Emerson, in your piece in Foreign Policy, you've also suggested a a more immediate policy measure that tech companies should adopt on this front, namely the recognition of a a digital state of Palestine and and efforts to strengthen protections for for Palestinian speech. Can you elaborate on that? What would that entail and and how would it work? Well, sure thing. So we should remember that the United Nations recognizes the state of Palestine already. In 2012, 138 nations, a majority of the UN General Assembly, voted to admit Palestine as a non-member observer state to the UN, which gave it the same international legal standing as the Vatican. And we spent a long time digging to understand whether the social media companies, which are often so quick to brag about their the internationalist traditions and their their acceptance of international norms, whether they also recognize this 2012 UN decision. As I said, we couldn't get a clear answer, but it appears generally that they do not. And that in reality, when these companies are making these decisions, no matter their, their public representations, it seems a lot of their policy sees Palestinians as sort of a arrestive and stateless ethnic minority within the broader territories of Israel and Palestine. And they, they seem to adhere to a situation where Israeli law is not just operative over Israelis, but is also operative over everyone who lives in the Palestinian territories. And this is problematic because, as we've established, Palestinians have some international sovereignty. And the Israeli government has no incentive to recognize or particularly consider the civil liberties of Palestinians. And so we think that the social media companies here could play an important forcing function and kind of fill in the gaps. If they recognized a digital state of Palestine, that Palestinians have some inherent international sovereignty, this would, uh, we think, help create more due process when these companies are making decisions about whether to ban or restrict Palestinian speech. When these companies are also juggling different requests or pressure from the Israeli government, it also means that they would have a responsibility to take Palestinian interests under equal advisement, not just as people to be protected, but as sovereign digital citizens who have an inherent right to their own political expression. And at the end of the day, we think that recognizing a digital state of Palestine would reserve more rights to Palestinians and would ensure that their digital expression is not mediated exclusively by the Israeli security state, which is very much how things are going now. Eliza, did you want to add anything on that point? Yeah, I mean, I guess what I'll say is that, you know, it it sounds obvious, but most of these companies and indeed kind of the 
you know, founders of the commercial internet, such as it is today, never really planned in advance for their platforms to be the only mechanisms for free speech for, you know, politically contested environments for 20 years down the road. They couldn't have really built that in. Well, they probably could have, but they didn't. And so it makes sense now that we're in the situation where the power of these platforms, which do rule most of our lives and how we get information, are built around the idea of traditional nation states and national authority, because I think that's just basically, you know, the kind of baseline that the constructors of these platforms were operating from. So I can get more into this, you know, later too, but it does mean that when it comes to stateless people, refugees, asylum seekers, people who are contested, you know, live in contested territories or who are, you know, minorities living within the borders of their own nation, that does mean that the question of digital rights and digital sovereignty really has not been tested yet. And I think this is one of the first test cases for what that might mean and for how these companies will respond to the realities of how this is playing itself out right now. Look, this case is unique in the world. We have numerous examples where we're trying to figure out what to do to protect minorities in different countries. The Eritreans in Ethiopia, uh, the peoples of occupied Kashmir in the context of the Indian government. But in these different cases, while peoples lay claim to independent states, these are not states that are recognized by the majority of the United Nations. In the case of Palestine, there is an international recognition of a Palestinian state, but Palestinians do not enjoy any sort of even digital right that would be commensurate with this sovereignty. So this is sort of a critical case is, is one thinks about the, the future of Palestinian digital expression, but then also about the role of these companies. Are they the, the internationalist institutions that they claim that are devoted to some, some universal definitions and understandings of free speech and free expression? Or are they ultimately more beholden to governments than they want to let on? I think the answer to those questions are inextricably bound up in how they approach the issue of Palestinian statehood. We're running short on time here, but before we wrap up, I just wanted to give the two of you a chance if you had any final thoughts you wanted to to leave us with, maybe starting with you, Eliza. Sure. To just kind of go back to what I was sort of getting into earlier, when I worked in the humanitarian context and when I did research in and around refugee communities in the Middle East and in Europe, A lot of humanitarian organizations I talked with when it came to this question of securely messaging with refugee populations, for example, sending money, taking personal information, storing it securely, the idea of digital rights in a lot of people's minds for stateless people or for refugees just didn't really have the same weight or the same kind of meaning. You know, the idea was, you know, the right to privacy, the right to freedom of expression online. Those are kind of like more advanced <laughs> rights or something that, you know, we, we don't really have the time or considerations to protect. And I think this is really the basis of the types of questions we need to start asking ourselves in the wake of, you know, this conversation about Palestine, but also about the contestation of digital rights globally, as Emerson said, especially when it comes to kind of categorizations of people who don't have protection of, of, of a traditional state. Haaretz has estimated that about 80% of people who founded Israel's 700-ish cybersecurity companies have come through IDF intelligence. So I do think that when it means, when we need to think about, you know, how companies like this are exporting surveillance software, contact tracing software that might, you know, not necessarily have privacy built into it. I think it's important to watch this pipeline and to sort of really closely watch how the case of, you know, Israel basically being kind of a national testing ground for the next frontier of digital rights violations, which it tests first on Palestinians in many cases and then exports abroad. I think this is something that we should watch really closely and to really consider how these definitional issues when it comes to content moderation decisions have ramifications that we really couldn't have predicted and that a lot of us, especially as native English speakers, just wouldn't really be able to comprehend. So I'm going to watch this space closely, and I hope that our listeners will do that as well. Emerson, how about you? You've got the last word here. All right. Well, thank you, Alistair. I came to this issue not as a Middle East expert. Now, if you're listening to the MEI podcast, you probably follow Middle East politics very closely. 
But I think this this issue of Palestinian digital expression, it matters a great deal, uh, not just in the context of regional politics or, or even for the fate of Palestinians, but for the fate of activist movements more broadly. Because what's happening in Palestine right now is an ostensibly liberal democratic government working with ostensibly liberal Silicon Valley companies to create a very effective censorship regime targeting of people whose only effective recourse is are their voices. And I've been reminded again and again researching this issue of a disinformation campaign that I followed closely last year, where during racial justice protests following the, the murder of George Floyd in the United States in the summer of 2020, the Trump administration and Trump administration proxies tried aggressively to associate these protesters with quote, Antifa terrorists, to essentially draw equivalency between this racial justice protest and between this vaguely defined terrorist organization. And the intention of this was to ramp up policing against these protests, but also to try to suppress the speech of these protesters and to limit how effectively they could organize online. What was interesting here was even as some institutions of the U.S. government were captured and part of this disinformation effort, the social media companies fought back hard. They really put their foot down in favor of these American activists. And as a result, the government efforts came to nothing. But I, I've just been reflecting, what if things had been a bit different? What if instead of these activists enjoying the protection of these companies, what if they were actually facing the same sort of circumstances that Palestinians face every day? where the companies themselves were also acquiescent to the government and had no particular incentive to stand up for these people. My sense is that this movement would have gotten crushed. My sense is that any democratic activist movement around the world could not withstand the pressures that seem to be lobbied every day against Palestinians. And so I, I think that this the censorship regime that we've covered and talked about here that's happening first in Palestine, if it proves to be effective and if no one stops it, it is going to be exported elsewhere. And these events that are unfolding in the Middle East are not going to stay there. We'll have to leave things there for today, but this is definitely an issue that we'll be watching closely going forward. Eliza Emerson, thank you very much for joining the program and for this really important discussion. Thanks so much. It was great to be here. Thank you. That was Eliza Campbell and Emerson T. Brooking. You can follow all of MEI's coverage of digital rights, Israel and Palestine on our website at www.mei.edu. Thank you to our listeners for tuning in and to our production team for their work on today's episode. You can follow MEI on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube, and subscribe to our email newsletters for the latest analysis and information about upcoming events. I'm Alistair Taylor. We will see all of you next week. This has been a presentation of the Middle East Institute. To support MEI's programs and podcasts, please donate at www.mei.edu. Thank you for your support.